Hi. The work I'll be presenting today is uh, entitled Harnessing Population-Based Patterns and Inferring Ecological Signal from Complex Foodborne Pathogen Whole Genome Datasets. This work was done by me, Natasha Plavovich, and, and Andrew K. Benson from the University of Nebraska, uh, Lincoln. First of all, I don't do this alone, and uh, one thing I'd like to uh, be explicit about is my faith in God, and as a disciple of Jesus Christ, I hold these three main values as, uh, as, uh, as an individual and as our family. Uh, I speak by, you know, on a personal level here and not representing our, our institution. Uh, but this is very important to us to be very open to of who we are and how much we care about people at all levels. And I also would like to thank Dr. Andrew Benson and Dr. Natasha Plavovich because they're more than collaborators, they're friends uh, and part of our family as well. Second, I'd like to thank all the collaborators that we have across the University of Nebraska system, the Nebraska Food for Health Center, University of Minnesota, I State, a group in Brazil, at the USDA, uh, FSIS, and Nebraska One Health Initiative in Niamhry. So the work I'm going to be presenting today is a blend of uh, uh, genomics, ecology, and data science to identify novel applications for complex bacterial data sets. Typically, when you're doing a whole genome sequence project and you're trying to track pathogens and identify signatures of past selection that are reflecting uh, some kind of fitness advantage in a, in a in a sample or in a reservoir, we're interested in, in specifically in the terms of foodborne pathogens in identifying genotypes that can move from livestock through the food chain all the way to humans. The specimen typically collected are isolates, and we then do DNA sequence, and the actionable knowledge that we seek to understand is how to track populations at different levels of genomic resolution, how to identify stable genomic regions for rapid and accurate diagnosis, and how to access novel mitigation strategies and develop novel ecological proven approaches that would be able to mitigate the process. In terms of whole genome sequencing, this approach of using real-time uh, genomic epidemiology has become very clear with the COVID crisis. In terms of tracking SARS-CoV-2, we can see the, a very readily application of using uh, population-based analysis in, for tracking, for first, identifying lineages uh, that are emerging over time across different geography, and uh, second, trying to identify signatures uh, or genomic signatures that discern between these lineages uh, as it pertains to mutations uh, in the case of SARS-CoV-2. Now, in the case of bacteria, this becomes a little bit more complex because the size of the genome is uh, in uh, orders of magnitude higher and the population structure is, is, more, is more complex. One thing that we need to take into consideration is first that bacteria reproduce asexually, so cells divide by binary fission, and the genetic diversity that accumulates over time is based on mutation, gene acquisition, gene deletion, and recombination. And recombination is, can vary, can, uh, can be legitimate and illegitimate, such as the acquisition of uh, bacteriophages or transposons, or the swap of uh, DNA, uh, segments of DNA uh, upon acquisition from the environment. Now, as the bacterial population expands in a particular environment, it, leads, it leaves a, a DNA fingerprint. And in here we have two colors represent, uh, representing two specific lineages of the same species. And when the, when the darker shade of blue color expands, we can then use whole genome approaches, uh, whole genome sequencing approach to do a population-based inquiry, which would lead us to identify what are the genomic events associated uniquely with this lineage that is not present here at all. 
So when we one of a simple way and a very straightforward way to do bacterial population genomic analysis is to use specific segments of the DNA or specific loci. In the case of multi-local sequence typing, uh, typically what's done is you PCR up seven, dif seven different loci scattered across the chromosome of a, a particular bacterium. These seven genes are ubiquitously, ubiquitously spread across the population. As you sequence those uh, uh, genes, what you identify is, is you can then identify specific alleles that when mapped to a specific database creates a, a numerical string which represents the allele for that particular gene. So in this case, you have gene, let's say one, all the way through seven. And for gene one, we have allele three. For gene seven, we have allele 21. The combination of these numbers forms a sequence type, which is a genotype at the level of seven genes. So that allows for uh, identification of genotypes below the species level and the taxonomic uniformity to uh, identify genotypes across uh, laboratories, uh, even across the world. Now, as I said before, the bacterial population reproduces asexually, which is very different than the sexual recombination that happens in, uh, in mammalian genomes, which leaves a more random uh, distribution of alleles across different genes or different loci. So if you look at the pop a bacterial population structure, uh, as here it pertains to six uh, representative genes, you see that the colors are not randomly distributed. They leave a very specific combination of alleles, which are numbers here. So if you look, you have six genes on the top, and then each horizontal line here represents a haplotype or a combination of alleles across different genes. And uh, when you compare those sequences, you can then cluster them based on that allelic distribution. And you can see that compared to a mammalian uh, genome uh, uh, in this fictitious example here, you see that uh, the combination of alleles is not random. Uh, the implications of that are major. They can uh, have implications for outbreak investigation, tracking, surveillance, and phylogenetic analysis of population. Because as you can see, if you go back to that SARS-CoV-2 example, you could map onto this phylogeny not only the sequence type that is associated uh, with the genome, but also the geographical and uh, the geographical information, which would allow us to see which STs for a particular species are emerging across, uh, across the world, practically speaking. Now, as I said, the MLST, the multi-local sequence type level analysis is, uh, is uh, one level of resolution. For those who are accustomed with um, uh, microbial genomics, they know that we we can, we can use the 16S ribosomal RNA gene to do a, sur a survey of the uh, microbial community in a particular environment. Now, this is one ubiquitous, ubiquitous gene spread across all species. Now we can select genes that are uniquely present in a particular species. Those are the MLST genes. And this MLST type analysis can be expanded going from seven genes to many thousands, uh, 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 many thousands uh, uh, of genes. Uh, in this example, I'm writing here 1,000 uh, genes, uh, for instance. And uh, so then what happens is as we go from the 16S to more levels of resolution, we gain genotypic resolution. So here at the 16S is a too low of resolution even to identify a species level, but the more low side you add to that analysis, the more 
uh, uh, the more resolution you gain. But, uh, and if you're doing an epidemiological investigation, uh, you want to have more loci to gain enough resolution to discriminate between isolates come, coming from the same sample or even different sample types or different environments. Now, that creates a, a system like this, which is a, you can call as a hierarchical based population structure analysis and mining of pan genomes. So the bacterial genome is typically, it has a, a pan genomic composition because it can be, it can be distributed between core genome and accessory genome. The core genome are the genes that are present in 99 to 100% of the isolates. So if you pick a single species, let's say Listeria monocytogenes or E. coli, the core genome would be the genes present in 99 to 100% of the isolates. The accessory genome is the remainder uh, loci. Typically this, uh, the most informative con content of the accessory genome are the shell genes. Or the shell genes are, are genes that are present in 15 to 95% of the genome. So with the core genome, we can get MLST, which is the uh, genotypical level resolution of seven genes, all the way to CGMLST, core genome MLST analysis, which inclu includes all the core genome, core genome uh, uh, loci. Or a more agnostic genotypic analysis using the core genome inf alleles or loci as well, using a Bayesian appro approach for classification, which is called BAPS. Which some, so this genotypic analysis, this canonical genotypic analysis using the core genome framework plus the accessory genome can lead us to three points. One, trait discovery for pathogen, pathogen mitigation, discover of cryptic lineages or ecotypes, and potential predictive epidemiology. In our work, we have, the, so since this analysis of whole genome sequence from bacteria includes multiple steps and can become very cumbersome, we have developed a, 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 a tool called ProKivo, which is an automated, reproducible, and scalable framework for high-throughput bacterial population genomic analysis. Pretty much what we do is by using the Pegasus platform, which allows for a linear combination of algorithms, we have combined multiple algorithms used worldwide by multiple by different research groups from assembly, quality control, and pain genomic mapping. So there is a, those are all very well established tools such as Rory, Proca, and PubMLST, Sister for Salmonella. We combine these in a single tool that allows the user to simply upload a text file containing the sequence, the SRA IDs or the NCBI SRA IDs for the genome. And Prokiva will fetch all the sequences and classify them into genotypes at different levels of resolution, including MLST, BAP, CGMLST, and do pan genomic analysis. In terms of output with this hierarchical based population genomic analysis, what we get is this. We get a phylogenetic, which is the innermost layer of this uh, graph here. So we get a core genome phylogeny for onto, for which we can then plot the hierarchical population structure onto it, which has layers of resolution. At at the innermost ring, we have the lowest level of resolution or the highest level of resolution and goes all the way to the lowest level of resolution, which typically includes fewer. So you go from fewer loci to more loci. So you go from a very high level to a very low level of resolution. And depending on the question you have, which is, might be ecological or epidemiological, the level of resolution used for the analysis will change. But, but what's important here as well is that onto this phylogenetic based mapping of hierarchical genotypes going, in the case of Salmonella, from serotypes all the way to CGMLST, you could be plotting traits or the prediction of traits based on the pan genomic content, which is demonstrated here on the right side by the antibiotic resistant genes associated with 
ST genotypes. So practically speaking, this type of analysis can be, excuse me, can generate information for surveillance, surveillance and, and uh, functional prediction of traits associated with uh, pest selection. Now, all the examples I'll be uh, demonstrating here today are going to be with Salmonella enterica, which is a major foodborne pathogen, major zoonotic pathogen, for which the serotypic distribution covers the population structure. What does that mean? That means that, it's, that, that means that if you have the ST level information for a Salmonella, you, you could with high accuracy predict which serovar you have or vice versa. In this case, we're going to be working with someone, the species Salmonella enterica and the sublineage 1, for which we're going to be focused on, gas, or on serovars capable of causing gastroenteritis. So, as I said before, these hierarchical population structure analysis can begin with seven genes all the way with the with utilizing the entire information which is the whole genome and this example with the salmonella typhimurian serovar we can show the different levels of genomic resolution and the impact it has in the population structure the fewer loci we have the more the fewer dominant genotypes we see. Mind you that every circle, circle here represents a genotype. Each color represents a genotype. The diameter, of, the diameter of the circle represents its proportion in the population. So if you have seven locus, you can see that there is one dominating genotype. The more loci you add, going from seven all the way to the whole genome, the more sparse the population becomes, for which we can see that the phylogenetic tree topology fractionates to the point that uh, each genotype is in very low frequency. And that has major implications, spe specifically for ecological and versus epidemiological inquiries. If you're doing an epidemiological investigation, you need more information. So typically, you're going to do the analysis at this level, the CGMLST, or the whole genome MLST, because you have more uh, you have more information to discriminate between isolates uh, to discern what is the source of the outbreak. Now, if you have if you are doing an ecological uh, uh, inquiry, then perhaps where the where, when you are considering the frequency distribution, a trait that could be measured, then you would perhaps use lo fewer loci or, or higher level resolution analysis so that you can have enough uh, 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 of a frequency of any given genotype to measure, measure it over time. And that has an enormous implication because the more sparse the distribution is, the less frequent any given genotype becomes. So if, that, if it, the, uh, the frequency of genotypes can be measured as a trait, that complicates the analysis. So here's a more uh, defined example. The higher the resolution, the more sparse the, the population becomes. What is that? So if you go from the legacy MLST, which includes seven genes only, to all the way it includes uh, the entire genome, you gain a lot of resolution going from here to here. But if you measure the frequency of any given genotype, you can see that the population becomes very sparse, which is good for epidemiological investigation, but not very good for ecological, uh, for tracking of, uh, of genotypes over time and, uh, and do a fitness-based analysis. And in this particular example, you use almost uh, 21 to 23 serovars of Salmonella and you can see that uh, uh, the pattern is the same across all uh, serovars, which is if you have a legacy MLST analysis, which includes seven loci, you can see pretty much one, uh, one uh, ST dominating across each serovar. And the more, the more loci you add, 
the more sparse the population becomes. That's represented here, which, which is uh, showing the frequency distribution of uh, ST genotypes across uh, 23 serovirus of salmonella, 23 zoonotic serovirus of salmonella, and you can pretty much see that there is one genotype that dominates across each serovirus. And that's, that, that is, as we said, the serotyp serotypic distribution of salmonella is covariates with the population structure and can be predicted from the, from the ST distribution, which is this. If I know I have ST33, I could with high accuracy predict that, that that's uh, serovar hater. Uh, and, and why is that happening? That's happening due to the clonal exp expansion couple, which leads to a which is due to a high linkage disequilibrium, which is a non-random association of uh, the, the alleles associated with the serotypic classification of salmonella with the alleles or loci associated with the MLST classification. There's a high linkage between those two, which leads to this high covariance in the population. If you know the serovar you have, you could predict with high accuracy the ST you have, and vice versa. That has also major other implications for ecology because you could, you could look for other traits or other genome features that are associated with ST and the genes associated with the serotypic classification make predictions, let's say, for antimicrobial resistance. If there is high linkage between the ST loci with loci associated with AMR, antimicrobial resistance, then you could predict that you could predict that AMR profile based on the ST that you have, with a, a degree of uh, accuracy that may vary across pieces. And that's all due to this uh, linkage disequilibrium, which is this non-random association of alleles across different loci. Now. Here is an example of hidden genetic diversity below the ST level of, uh, of genotypic resolution. So we're zooming into the Salmonella population. We looked into Salmonella enteric, and now we're looking into the Salmonella typhimurian. And basically, we're going into the Salmonella of the ST19, which is this dark blue circle. Uh, if you're using seven low psi, the major ST in the Salmonella typhimurian population is ST19. But if you add more low sign to the analysis, you can see that by using the ribotype scheme, which, com uh, which uh, combines more than 50 ribosomal genes, you can see that the ST19 population is a highly variable population. Each color here represents a different ribotype underneath or hidden in the ST19 population. And if you use the CGMLST analysis, you can see that, it's even, that there's even more genetic diversity under the ST19 level resolution. So this is a very clear example in which if you add uh, a few dozen more loci, you gain resolution just enough to get an ecological signal in the sense that you'd still, that you gain genotypic resolution, but you still have enough meaningful frequency frequency variation across any given genotype that would allow you to look at uh, temporal distribution that would be meaningful to ask questions uh, in terms of ecology and potential genetic determinants of, uh, of uh, ecological success. Now, if you add too many loci, you gain resolution, but the population becomes so sparse that it may not help in terms of finding an ecological signal in terms of uh, you know, changing host or changes over time in a, in, a, in a particular reservoir, but it will allow for, uh, for having more information to uh, having higher accuracy in uh, epidemiological or outbreak investigation. That's also represented here in a different fashion in plot A, we look at the, uh, the temporal distribution of uh, ST19 versus all the other STs in the Salmonella typhimurian uh, population, and that's intercontinental and across different niches. And as you add more, uh, uh, going from A to B, you add more loci, 
moving from ST to ribotypes, you can see that there are two ribotypes dominating this population, or this lineage of ST19. So underneath the ST19, there's two major ribotypes. Uh, and if you go from here to the CG MLST analysis, you can see that that frequency distribution is very low. So for again, for epidemiological inquiry, that may be very useful, but for ecological inquiry, that might be a better level of resolution to stay at. And that's represented here as we go and look at the temporal distribution of these ribotypes, specifically from uh, the ribotype 3484 versus the others. We can see a very distinct pattern of this ribotype with an increased frequency of the ribotype 3484 over time. And, uh, and that allows for a specific questions to be answered. What could be the genetic determinants that allow for ribotype 3484 to dominate in specific reservoirs or, or geography? Now, with this, uh, with these, the use of these uh, hierarchical population-based analysis, we can ask this question, what is the optimal level of genotypic resolution for an epidemiological or ecological inquiry? In a very recent opinion article by Dr. Martin Wiedemann's group, it was pointed out that perhaps we need to move past the species classifications to do a risk assessment of salmonella in the food chain. Because right now, if, uh, if you say, let's say, all salmonella typhimurian are equally capable of causing zoonosis, you would uh, put a policy forward that would require you to pretty much destroy all the salmonella typhimurian in all samples. But if there is genotypic diversity that's meaningful in the sense that more, some genotypes are more capable of jumping from animals and survive across the food chain and cause zoonosis or move into humans to cause outbreaks, then perhaps we should be focusing our uh, part of our control of salmonella type mirror would be to enhance the level of resolution we have in an epidemiologic investigation to track genotypes that would confer a uh, uh, higher risk from, of jumping from animals to humans. Well, if that's true, then first we need to identify the optimal level of genotypic resolution. And second, we need to look at specific, at that level of resolution, what are the characteristics or attributes that would allow that genotype to move across the food, the food chain successfully to cause an outbreak. And that's a very important point to be made because the more, um, uh, outbreak investigations are, are, can be very complex, and as you can see here, even with the use of whole genome sequence analysis, uh, it, be, it can be very cumbersome to determine where the strain that's causing an outbreak in humans is coming from, since it can be coming from multiple sources. So how do we then, can we use uh, this hierarchical-based uh, pan-genomic analysis to enhance our ability to map and track genotypes of interest and potentially identify traits that would allow us to mitigate the, mitigate the problem across the food chain? So one thing that we can do first here is to, uh, and that's demonstrated with this example of a project we're carrying out with the USDA FSIS on the Salmonella enteritis. Salmonella enteritis is typically found in poultry. At the ST level, almost 100% of the population is ST11, which means if you're doing a genotypic analysis or an epidemiologic investigation at the ST level, you will not be able to discern what's going on because you don't have enough genotypic resolution. That's with the MLST-based approach using seven genes. Now, if we jump from the ST to the CG MLST analysis, which is uh, demonstrated here, each, each color in this uh, frequency-based distribution plot represents a different CG MLST. As you can see, the black and the green CG MLST genotypes or variants dominate in the population. As we look across geography, you can see that in the poultry industry, these two uh, variants are widespread. 
But one thing that we've seen over time is that there is this unique variant the, the red, represented in the red color here, dark red, emerging in the population. And we can track this to a specific type of producer of a specific size and, mo in, and the, its predominance in specific, uh, specific sample types. So what this demonstrates is these are, are two points. First, the level of genotypic resolution utilized will dictate how much resolution you can gain, and uh, it will also uh, facilitate the tracking of genotypes over time. Specifically here, you can see that we can not only detect the two major genotypes, but also detect the emergence of a particular genotype over time. And the fact that this, this genotype is associated with a specific producer uh, or specific facilities, we could then try to investigate what is causing it to emerge in that particular production site. And now, this is, these are all poultry samples. The next question that we could use is, uh, or we could uh, ask is, is this red genotype emerging in the human population? So that's the importance of uh, determining, of using different levels of genotypic resolution to do this uh, analysis across uh, reservoirs. The next step in the analysis is that we can gain further resolution in this population-based analysis by using the accessory genome. So by using the accessory genome here, we can further stratify these, uh, these uh, black and green clone into sub-lineages, sub which, is, which is this. So the core genome is utilized to define if we have the black or the green variant. But by adding, by subclustering the population based on the accessory genome, which is representing this dendrogram here, we can identify two subclusters for the green CGMLST, which then proposes that there is a, a specific evolutionary trajectory here. The black CGMLST is clonal at the whole genome level. Why? Because at the accessory genome level, it cannot be substratified. So which means there's high linkage disequilibrium between the core and accessory loci. Now, as for the green clone, what's happening is that there's two subvariants based on the accessory genome. So that's a clear example for which, in when in an outbreak, the core genome is not sufficient to discriminate between the two sources, source A and B, perhaps by adding the accessory genome, we could gain enough resolution to discriminate. Perhaps we could say that these sublineages coming from farm A, and these sublineages coming from farm B, and let's say that this, in this fictitious example, the variant A or subvariant A would more likely to jump from poultry to humans. That's how the combination of a hierarchical population-based analysis and accessory genome cluster would allow us to not only map and track genotypes, but gain enough resolution to discern what's going on. Now, we went one step further uh, and did the same analysis of three uh, different uh, serovars that, and this paper has been published already. And in this particular paper, we got, we utilized data from NCBI from three specific serovars that were selected on based on two different criteria. First, based on ecological criteria, Salmonella typhimurium is a more uh, uh, gene, it's a more generalist. It can be found in multiple livestock reservoirs, pea, cows, and poultry. Salmonella newport is typically found in bovine, and Salmonella infantis is typically found in poultry, although that can, uh, uh, they can be found in other uh, reservoirs as well, but not as, as variable as Typhimura. Now, as for the degree, degree of uh, clonality at the, at the core genome level, you can see that based on the coloring scheme here, that the more colors you see, the more genetic diverse the population is. So Typhimura is more, has a higher degree of genetic diversity compared to uh, Salmonella infantis. So you'd say that Salmonella typhimurin has a lower degree of clonality and Salmonella infantis has a higher degree of uh, clonality. 
our question was this by selecting three specific uh, uh, serovirus of salmonella with this distinct ecology and degree of genetic diversity what would be the contribution of the accessory genome in terms of first game resolution for epidemiological investigation and two predict traits associated with specific genotypes at different levels of resolution so for the salmonella salmonella type murin we're going to be focused on st34 which is a major sublineage of salmonella type murin also classified as salmonella monophasic which tip for for which typically the reservoir is swine and at the moment we don't know uh, if uh, all uh, st because remember st34 is still a variable population of the cgmlst level as represented here in this graph at the moment we don't know but we have a, we have a hypothesis that there are cgmlsts there are potentially three classes of cgmlsts underneath the st34 or someone on a monophasic population those that are only capable of surviving those that are present in swine but cannot jump into humans but can cause clinical disease in swine and those that are capable of jumping to humans but would have a variable degree of zoonotic potential or the capacity of either transmit to humans or cause uh, or cause severe disease in humans Right now, we don't have enough data to demonstrate this, but we're working on analyzing data sets that uh, would allow us to uh, get a, uh, more information onto this. Nonetheless, our focus on, is on this particular population that is typically multi-drug resistant. The question that we asked for this analysis is broken down into three steps. First, we begin with a training data set with many thousands of genome. We identify the level of genotypic resolution that we care about, and that's at the ST level. We found this population, of, we did a, a phylogenetic-based analysis for which each row here represents either a level of genotypic resolution or a gene. In golden, we have the genes that are present. In purple, they're absent. Long story short, we were able to identify, along with others, that uh, the ST34 has this island or this mobile genomic island that contains genes that can cover resistance to copper, arsenic, and silver. What this analysis allows us is this. This population large-scale analysis allow us to first identify a specific level of genotypic resolution that we care about, and second, predict traits of interest based on the accessory genome content. If that's useful, then you could select strains from the different genotypic backgrounds, demonstrate that they have the low psi of interest, and then go into the lab and do phenotypic analysis to demonstrate to prove that the genotype is linked to the phenotype of interest. And in this case, we did a proof of concept with ST34 in demonstrating that ST34 was more likely to be resistant to, cop resistant to copper under either aerobic and anaerobic conditions in the laboratory. An implication of this is, for instance, that copper is used in the animal diet and could be a, a selecting factor to, for the persistence of ST34 in the swine population. We did the same analysis for a Salmonella Newport, and now we zoomed into the ST45 population. And here we're able to predict something different. We're able to identify an allele of the Shug E gene that typically comes from resistance to quaternary ammonia. And although this does not explain, this is the no, not, not the sole basis to explain the ammonia quaternary, uh, the quaternary ammonia resistant phenotype, we're able to link this. Uh, uh, genetic variation, which is the presence of this Shug E2 uh, uh, allele in the ST44-45 genotypic population in the S in the Fortis Salmonella Newport, with a, on average higher resistance uh, 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 to quaternary ammonia. Well, if that is true, if there is linkage to equilibrium or higher linkage to equilibrium between the quaternary ammonium trait with the ST uh, 
genotypic resolution under the, uh, underneath the S, the someone in a Newport uh, lineage. Uh, the implication is this. If this were happening with a high accuracy, you could predict the ammonia quaternary, quaternary ammonia based on the ST distribution. You would say that if you have ST, ST45 in a production facility with high accuracy, you'd be able to predict that uh, it's resistant to quaternary ammonia. And in terms of practical application, this would say this would turn into changing the disinfectant using the production facility to uh, mitigate the, the problem. So if Salmonella Newport ST45 is persistent in a production facility, and we could predict with high accuracy the, this particular trait, you would recommend change the disinfectant, and that would be able to mitigate the process, mitigate the problem. So now that's a proof of concept. That's not that's not uh, uh, that may may or may not be true. But what allows us is to use more deployable techniques techniques such as the mean ion that could be used inside of a plant to sequence the genomes and based on ST classification predict those kind of traits. Now a third type of analysis that we've done. So the first two. Uh, 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 cases here that were demonstrated were for for either Salmonella typhimurium or Salmonella uh, uh, Newport. We demonstrate the use of the accessory genome to predict a trait that could uh, facilitate the ecological success of that particular lineage. Now, in the case of Salmonella infantis, we were able to use the accessory genome to demonstrate a hidden or a cryptic ecotype present in the population. So basically what we've done is this. We've done the hierarchical population analysis of the Salmonella infantis, excuse me, population. But at, at all levels of resolution, we're not able to identify anything meaningful, ST, BAPS, or CGMLST. It was only when we did a principal component analysis using the shell genes or a fraction, the informative fraction of the accessory genome that we're able to identify this blue cluster here for which we're able to map with the metadata and find out that this blue cluster is typically associated with poultry. So there is underneath the Salmonella infantis population a cluster that can be found based on the accessory genome that predicts the source of the isolate. So that's demonstrated in the next slide. So if you look at the source attribution graph and the distribution of these two clusters, which we are referred here as ecotypes, the blue one is ecotype one, which predominantly is found in poultry. When you do a temporal analysis of it, we can see that there appears to have been a recent introduction of this ecotype one into the poultry population, which could be uh, associated with uh, a historical event or uh, a major shift in the population. A historical process here could be a depopulation and a repopulation of poultry farms, let's say through, due, due to, uh, to uh, an influenza outbreak. You have to kill a lot of birds, you reintroduce a new genotype, and then it brings along a different uh, variant or ecotype of Salmonella infantis. Now, for that particular population as well, we're able to map. So these two groups here represent the ecotype one in a phylogenetic depiction of Salmonella infants isolates. And you can see that there is a unique plasmid associated with both clusters and a unique set of uh, antimicrobial resistant genes, which classify this ecotype one as uh, MDR, more, uh, or predicts it to be an MDR, multi-drug resistant uh, ecotype. So that's the, that's uh, and that's the power of doing this uh, uh, pan genomic analysis, for which you do your canonical population structure analysis with the core genome. You add the metadata onto it, which allows you to look at specific uh, attributes of the population, source, year, or geographical distribution. And by adding the accessory genome com uh, component, you can then either predict traits or identify cryptic lineages that could not be discerned using the core genome. 
Now, what is the application of this? We have three specific applications uh, that came out of this work or actionable, actionable information. For the Salmonella type immune, we can we uh, uh, propose that, that there is a need for a risk assessment to quantify the impact of either environmental water uh, and, or livestock dietary copper uh, and its impact on ST34 prevalence in livestock. Uh, in the case of Salmonella Newport, and specifically in pigs. In the case of Salmonella Newport, uh, the prediction would be that if this were true, that uh, ST45 is associated with, with uh, a quaternary ammonium resistance, then uh, this would be a case for which geno the genotypic mapping uh, would allow for uh, a, a quick prediction of, uh, that would lead to alteration of sanitation protocols uh, to control the pathogen, which would be uh, based on this ST surveillance. Now, in the case of Salmonella infantis, it's a different story. The accessor genome, uh, uh, instead of uh, infer, infer, not only was important for inferring traits such as AMR, but was also important for identifying cryptic ecotypes present in the population that would nonetheless not be identified. And that was only possible by doing this combination of a scalable hierarchical population-based analysis, including the accessor genome. With that said, we have this particular question here. That's what have we learned so far about the population genomics and ecology of pathogens using whole genome sequence data? Well, we can use different approaches to do this type of analysis. We can use an epidemiological, comparative genomics, a population genomics, and a quantitative genomics approach. If you're using an epidemiologic approach, uh, the application will be used for source tracking. And what we learn is the transmission patterns of a pathogen. If you then jump into a comparative genomic analysis, you can compare the difference of genes and uh, SNPs across a population. And the inference would be functional uh, differences that you have between isolates. But when you look at a population genomics approach, uh, for which the frequency distribution of genotypes become meaningful, then you can uh, understand the dynamics of the pathogen and the ecological factors that are shaping those dynamics across geography over time. And then if included into this the quantitative genomics approach, that then would allow us to not only identify genotypes of interest, but also to map uh, the putative, putative uh, causative genes or, or, or loci or alleles associated with the trait of interest. So then I finish here uh, again by thanking all the uh, uh, thanking all the collaborators. We've been I've been particularly blessed uh, in having multiple people over the time over time that have. Uh, uh, collaborated with us and help us uh, uh, move forward with our science. With that, I thank you for your attention and uh, uh, thank you for thank you the uh, organizers uh, Jennifer Clark, Dr. Jennifer Clark, Noah, and others for the uh, the invitation to participate in this conference. It's a privilege and a blessing to be here. Thank you.